I feel so much more comfortable about where to look for information. When I do find information, I feel comfortable understanding it to a better degree than I used to be able to. I feel confident that I know what I'm talking about to a certain degree to where like I want to know more and I want to tell people about what I know so that they can realize it's not that hard. Like you just have to inform yourself, honestly. Hi, I'm Clarice Grody and welcome to the Amplify OT podcast. I'm an occupational therapist by trade and a policy wonk by choice. This podcast is here to help you survive and thrive in the U.S. healthcare system through a better understanding of policy, advocacy, and value-based care. So let's dive in. Crystal has been with me for the last 14 weeks, and those 14 weeks have definitely flown by very fast. She's been a really big part of my company here at Amplify OT and helping me with all sorts of projects. So I figured today would be a good time for her to come and talk about her experiences and what she learned and just kind of tell you a little bit more about the capstone experience, especially since I did not have one since I only did my master's. And so therefore, I only did field work. So I'm excited to hear her perspective and have you all hear about all the work that she's done. So Crystal, welcome and tell everyone a little bit about yourself. Well, hello. My name is Crystal. Thank you for having me, Clarice. I go to Gannon University in Florida. We have a campus up in Pennsylvania as well. And I'm pursuing my doctorate in occupational therapy. So as Clarice said, I was required to also do my capstone rather than just the two field works. So for the capstone, you kind of get to choose what you'd like to know more about. So it's more of a self-directed learning. The student gets to choose for themselves. And I decided that I wanted to know more about advocacy. Originally, I wanted to do program development for young adults who were like graduating from high school and making their way either into higher level education or the workforce. And so as I was thinking about that, my capstone professor kind of asked me, what do you want to learn from these kids? And I was like, well, I didn't really want to learn anything from them. I kind of just wanted to speak on their behalf and I wanted to help them. And so she said to me, well, if you want to do that, why don't you learn more about advocacy and like policy and legislation and what it takes for these types of things to happen so that you can like help them kind of on a more broad spectrum than just something so small. And immediately I was terrified. I was like, oh, that (laughs) sounds like a lot. That sounds like way higher level than anything I'm capable of. But knowing myself, I was like, because I'm afraid of that, absolutely. Like I want to do it. And I was lucky enough to find Clarice. And so we began our journey together. And it's been Um, awesome. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Crystal and I met at AOTA in March and we both went to an advocacy workshop. I always like going to these types of sessions to see what other people are saying and maybe learn some new teaching ideas. And Crystal was there trying to find some connections and also learn more about advocacy. And so we both happen to be up at the front. And if you do go to presentations at AOTA Inspire, always go talk to the speakers afterwards because it's always interesting to kind of hear what people are talking about. And that's where I heard afterwards that she was looking for a capstone opportunity because I had kind of gone up there to network and tell them that I was potentially interested in taking a capstone student because these were professors giving the speech. And so I had been really interested in taking on a capstone student, but I honestly wasn't really sure that I was like fully ready for a student. But I did really feel bad for Crystal she's like I'm supposed to start in two months and I know that that capstone stuff is usually decided like a year in advance I mean I know I would have been panicking if I didn't have my fieldwork setting a month in advance and let alone a capstone so I know that had to have been extremely stressful it definitely was so especially whenever I met you and you had all the things that I was looking for in terms of what I wanted to learn I was like oh this is perfect (laughs) Yeah, I went up to you and I knew that I had heard you saying earlier that you were looking for a capstone project, especially in advocacy. And I knew that I was looking for a student. And it was just so funny because you immediately started like quizzing me right off the bat, like, okay, we know what is your business? What have you done? Kind of quizzing me on all my sort of qualifications. And I was like, shoot, okay. And I was impressed because I thought, man, this gal couldn't like really think on her feet. And of course, you know, I called my mom telling her that I think I got a capstone student. 
And she's like, well, how do you know that she's going to be able to keep up and start off, you know, especially because it's going to be virtual. And I was like, trust me, the way that she just quizzed me was, you know, making sure that I'm legit and that I know what I'm talking about shows me that she's someone who's going to come up with her own work and keep up fast and that she's real intelligent. And I'm just so glad that it ended up working out, not only for me, because I really needed someone, but also because you now get to graduate. (laughs) Oh, yeah. And I've learned so much more than I ever would have learned if I had just done another clinical rotation. Yeah. So I am so curious. I want you to tell them about what you worked on and what your project was, because I will admit I did feel a little bad back when we started because I told her, you know, all about our project and what we were going to do. And then I completely changed my mind and told her we were doing something else similar, but completely different. So just like, you know, that's how it goes sometimes in small businesses. So just a few days before she started out, I said, I've changed my mind. I've come up with a new plan. This is what we're doing. I'll see you next week. So, okay, tell them what you've worked on and what all we've been doing these last 14 weeks. So with Clarice, we have been working on a course. It's the New Grad Reimbursement Guide course. We've kind of played around the name with the name a little bit. So if you hear about it in the future, it might be something different. But the past five weeks, we've been running our beta launch. So what that is, it's kind of like a soft launch where we have all of the materials and we recorded videos based on various topics to kind of teach people about reimbursement, about policy, advocacy, and a bunch of different things that they may need to know that they didn't get from school and are interested in. So we put a bunch of videos together for that, which I I need to go back and like tell you all how I wrote the transcripts for the videos. But with this course, it's five weeks long and we had it on a timed release. So every Monday, our videos would go out to anyone who was participating in our course. And that came with different handouts that we created, kind of just like compiling all the information from the videos. We did worksheets, which were kind of fun little activities. It was crossword puzzles, fill in the blank, matching, things like that, kind of just to quiz everyone's knowledge and see if our videos were getting across the information that we intended for it to, and to make sure that everyone had a full understanding of what we were trying to tell them. So that happened for the past five weeks. We were kind of like working on them as we were sending them out just because it was a soft (laughs) launch. We were still trying to like figure out our groove in it all. But the way that I wrote all the transcripts was my first, I would say probably two weeks with Clarice. I kind of just had to learn as much as I could about the process of legislation, why policy is important, how I can get involved in it. How do I advocate? Is it actually as hard as I think it is? all things like that. But I went through Clarice's advocacy course, her adult rehab guide, any types of materials that she already had. I went through the Amplify OT website. I read all of her blog posts. (laughs) I read as much as I could. I was just trying to be a sponge in those first two weeks and understand as much as I could. And then of course with Clarice, I would, you know, we'd get on our Zoom calls and I'm like, okay, cool. Like I understand this part. And then I kind of got lost on the web down a rabbit hole, like just trying to figure out other things. So that's actually one thing that's really great about the course that we've developed is on one of the lessons, it talks about how to find information. And so why that's helpful is because then you're not really going down as much of a rabbit hole. I mean, it's always possible because the more you want to know, the more rabbit holes you're going to go down. So that was something we worked on. That's how I developed the transcripts. And then we also did social media posts and I learned how all of that like design works and how marketing strategies are made and you know what's best for business what a search engine operation is as a search engine search operation. engine optimization, optimization. Yeah. <laughs> yeah talking about you know if you're just working for a clinic you already have someone else doing that marketing i mean that's something that crystal and i talked about a lot you know Over here, I am a one-woman show, which means I do all my own videos, website editing. I edit all of my own stuff. I do all the social media stuff. I developed my own strategy. I do all of my own reading and research. So it's just kind of talking through the thousand different things that you have to consider because, I mean, we probably spent just an hour and a half even trying to discuss what the name was going to be and who the target audience is and how old they are and what they're struggling with. So if you're ever curious about marketing, those are the things that businesses are thinking about every single day, whether it's buying a water bottle or developing a course, 
And so kind of walking through all those things that we really don't have to think about all the time as everyday practitioners, even though those skills are sometimes really important. You know, think about when you sell yourself to a patient, essentially what you're doing is listing out, you know, this is why OT is important. Basically, you are engaging in marketing for OT to that patient. And so that's kind of what we did, looking at all those different aspects of designing a landing page and then social media, all that kind of stuff. So Crystal just had to take like a headfirst dive into essentially being an entrepreneur. Well, and there's so much that goes into it that like, you may think, okay, cool, you know, Clarice runs a social media page. But as we were just talking about, there's so much that goes into the thought of how to advertise it, even down to like the colors, like, yes, the name was a huge thing. But even like, how do we want to align this that'll draw somebody's eye? Like, there is so much to it, that it's really an endless job. It, it honestly <laughs> And then with like, after recording the videos, having to edit them, like there's just a lot that goes into it for sure. And then even keeping up to date, Clarice would give me podcast recommendations and different social media posts to follow or different groups on Facebook. So it's like, it can become your every day, like, and it is your every day for sure, because you can get information from everywhere. Even it wasn't OT stuff all the time. Sometimes it was just business things. Yeah, I pretty much sent all the podcasts that I listen to, all the different ones I listen to, NPR Politics Podcast, because that's kind of a good overview of what's going on in the political sphere in general. I listen to Sales Maven and Entrepreneurs on Fire. And so those are just kind of your plain old entrepreneur business podcasts. And then I also listen to OT specific ones, you know, like AOTA's podcast, Uncommon OT, OTs Get Paid, as well as some health affairs podcasts, What the Health. So just kind of a whole variety. I mean, If you ever need podcast recommendations, let me know because I listen to a lot of them. Because when you're busy, that's kind of the best way to get information um, and a good way to kind of get caught up to speed, which is a large part of why I started doing this podcast, was to help people get information in a way that fit into their job. But yeah, you you start to see how the whole picture comes together, how there's always a topic, a purpose, even designing the social media discussing, well, you know, this one has too many fonts or this one has too many colors. You know, what's the kind of clear message that we want people to take away and making sure that some of these are details. So they're a little bit smaller to draw people in. So you have to, you had to learn a lot and you did a great job. Thank you. And even keeping up with like today's recent trends, like you, you started making reels and like, you have to make reels that are popular at the time. So there's just, there's a lot for sure. Yeah, Crystal did a lot of that and as well as having to help me put together the transcripts and the videos because I think I definitely underestimated how much work it would take to put together this course, which we are still figuring out exactly what the name's going to be. I've been calling it like the adult Medicare OT reimbursement course, which is a terrible name, but I'm sure we'll figure out a better one. But we just figuring out what goes into each lesson and say like, this is really important information. Now, how do we cut that in half and figure how those things, how, like any of these topics we could have talked about for half an hour or more, you know? So for us to get it down into a five to 10 to 15 minute video that tells people what they need to know, gives everyone an understanding, but also doesn't overwhelm you with information. Well, it's really challenging. Yeah, it is definitely a lot, but such great stuff that, like I said, I would have never had the skills. I mean, I could have learned them later on, but I wouldn't have gotten that in a clinical setting. It's not something I would have been aware of or known how to do. Crystal and I will be right back after this quick break to talk more about how her perspective has changed, as well as her advice for future students and clinicians. If you're thinking about starting a podcast, then there's nothing I can recommend more than Anchor by Spotify. It's what I use to run the Amplify OT podcast, and if there's anything that I love more about it, it's that it's completely free. And as a small business owner, I am all about free resources. Anchor makes it super easy to have a podcast by having everything in one place. That means recording, that means sharing it on other podcast apps, and that also means ads and subscription services. So if you're ready to get your message out there, then head right now to download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started today. You know and I know that you need CEUs every single year in order to maintain your license. And I always recommend not only taking intervention-based CEUs, but also some policy-based ones. And there is no better place to do that 
than MedBridge. I partnered with MedBridge to give you the best discount possible so that way you can access those CEUs that you need to keep your license as well as ones that'll actually help you advance your career. By using the code AmplifyOT at checkout, you save 40% on your annual subscription or you can also use our affiliate link that's linked in the show notes. And one more time, that's code AmplifyOT for 40% off your annual subscription. I'm curious now, how has your perspective changed on thinking about policy being involved either in like AOTA or an advocacy and leadership position from before this experience to now that you've essentially been force fed policy and advocacy for the last 14 weeks? How has your perspective changed or has it changed since we started? It definitely has changed. At first, like I told you, I was terrified of that. I'm like, that is absolutely not my wheelhouse. Like the more that I learned about it, it's not something that immediately I was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. You know, I saw it over and over again and I looked at things many, many times and even still like now I'm not an expert, but I feel so much more comfortable about where to look for information. When I do find information, I feel comfortable understanding it to a better degree than I used to be able to. I feel confident that I know what I'm talking about to a certain degree to where like I want to know more and I want to tell people about what I know so that they can realize it's not that hard. Like you just have to inform yourself, honestly. Yeah. And that's how I got started in understanding advocacy and policy. You know, I've been doing it for about four and a half years or so, but it just started with reading and trying to find information and going down rabbit holes. Because yeah, when you read a policy, you understand like maybe a third of what it's talking about the first time. So you reread that article, you follow all the links to try and get more context. And then you go back to that original article you first looked at and it starts making more sense. And I think that's kind of the best thing about trying anything new or learning things for the first time. You know, think about when you read an intervention for a stroke the first time or trying to understand kinesiology. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense the first time you're exposed to it. And so you have to read it and look things up and put things into context. And then when you come back to it, all of a sudden it starts making more sense. And I think it's the same thing with policy. You know, now for me, it feels second nature after I've been exposed to it, you know, for example, being an occupational therapist for a few years. But when I think back to when I first started, you know, we're all kind of on the same path of learning. So the same way that we learn how to be an effective OT or a practitioner, the same way we can learn about policy. Yeah. And I honestly can't imagine going into this field and not knowing what I know now which is kind of terrifying how much of a skill, you know, you know, but, and I feel like also it was really encouraging. Like you are so young. So the fact that you jumped into this so young, it makes me feel like, okay, well, I don't have to be like in this field for 10 plus years before I'm able to know anything. You volunteered right off the bat. Like you got a job and you're like, I want a position. And that <laughs> kind of shows me that that's how you do it. Like, I don't have to have all of this criteria, we, we all think that we have to reach a certain level before we're allowed in. And I've realized that that's not the case. And I think that's really the whole point. I mean, thank you. I'm going to try and capitalize on being young as long as I possibly can. But I agree. You know, I think if anything, I'm evidence, like you said, that you can get involved right away. And of course, obviously, you don't have to. I usually encourage practitioners to take a good six months or so to get used to your first job and having to be a full-time adult. And then, you know, you could get into some of those positions later on. I don't know that I'd always recommend getting involved only a couple months later like I did, but, you know, timing works the way it's supposed to work. And so I think many people feel that policy is too hard or you have to have a certain amount of experience to understand it. And I've definitely proved that I don't have a doctorate. I don't have a PhD. I don't have multiple different degrees. All I have is my bachelor's and my master's in occupational therapy. And that's it. I don't have any specialty certifications or anything like that. I just attend a ton of policy and reimbursement based CEUs and read everything. And really, it just takes commitment and time. For sure. But good. I am glad that I was able to indoctrinate you into the ways of understanding policy and engaging in advocacy. So I want you to tell us what is your plan? What are you going to do? Obviously, first graduate and pass the NBCOT. And then what's next? So after that, I would like to do travel therapy. So that's my next goal because I kind of feel like 
in school, I was the student who I was like, well, I don't really know what setting I want to do yet because I, I haven't had experience with all of them. And I feel like the best way to get as much experience as I can in different settings for me as like a young single woman is to travel because I can do acute care for three months and then I can try out a sniff and then I can try out, you know, just whatever settings I feel like I could be interested in before I kind of like sit down and make a decision, which as we know, the great thing about OT is it never has to be final. (laughs) You can continue. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) So I love that. But I think I originally, because I didn't have much or really any experience in the field with it, I want to start in acute care. So acute care. That was my favorite. Yeah. And seeing that you liked it so much too, I'm like, okay, cool. I love to hear that. It really is such a fascinating setting. So for anyone who doesn't know, I worked in acute care for two and a half years before I left clinical work. So I'm fully non-clinical now. I also worked in home health for a few months and then went to acute. And I just really enjoyed it. And I'll be curious to hear how you feel about the policy after you've kind of worked in some of the different settings, but especially acute. I mean, in acute, you're in charge of making discharge plans primarily. You're essentially at the top of that healthcare food chain in terms of settings. So you don't get more acute, you know, than acute care. So uh, you're really charged with understanding to a certain extent reimbursement and inpatient rehab, SNF, home health, outpatient, hospice, because you're responsible for understanding the differences, you know, versus if you're in home health, you know, you're not going to refer someone to inpatient rehab as a discharge plan. So to an extent, you basically just kind of need to understand what the reimbursement is of any of the settings that come after you in the continuum of care. And part of that too is understanding what the continuum of care is in the first place. But I'd be really curious to hear how the policy information helps you when you are a full-fledged and paid OT. Oh, paid part. Can't wait. (laughs) Oh, yes. That sweet, sweet payday. Oh, yeah. That's definitely another thing, too, which is funny because I didn't know it was a fear of mine until now, which now it's not a fear, is that, you know, when you're at the end of OT school and you're like, okay, I'm finally about to, like, be a big girl and have a career – And there's that kind of like a little bit of unease, like, oh, I don't know what to expect. I didn't really know what some of that unexpected was. And then after learning about reimbursement and learning about value-based care and all of those things that you taught me, I'm kind of like, oh, this is something that I feel so confident in now. I feel so much more ready. And I didn't know that I was missing that. Yeah, I think some of that is understanding your role because to a certain extent, especially in the United States, you know, healthcare is really driven by money or reimbursement. Because ultimately, I mean, like if you go into a clinic right now and say, I want to do this, they're going to ask you first how you can get reimbursed for that. And even if it's in our scope of practice, what we are or not allowed to do with patients is very much driven by not only policy, but also reimbursement. Because if it doesn't get paid for, you know, companies aren't really in love with the idea of paying us for something that they're not going to get paid for. And I think understanding that reimbursement piece really helps us as practitioners understand how we fit into the system, or at least helps us understand the incentives of the payer and our employer, and helps us get a better grasp on what's expected. And that's not to say that, you know, OTs can't do amazing things that don't fit into a traditional healthcare model. But oftentimes what we do, especially when you're working within that traditional medical model, is really influenced by reimbursement. So healthcare is a very regulated field and understanding the rules of the road and how those rules impact us and the world we work in helps us not feel so much like we're fighting this weird invisible force or like we what we do doesn't matter because it really does. And we have to know that right language to express why what we do matters. And a lot of that language can be found in understanding quality measures and reimbursement. So without it, it's really easy to feel that sense of doubt and frustration in our jobs. Oh, yeah. Well, awesome. I am so glad that you were able to work with me. And I promise everyone this was not a promotional episode about Amplify OT's reimbursement course. Obviously, we think it's fantastic. And as a shameless plug, I will probably open signups again this fall probably early October, just a couple of tweaks to make after running through it the first time. We got a lot of really good feedback that I'm going to incorporate. I do have a wait list that's open right now, which I'll post a link to that in the show notes so you can sign up on the wait list and get notified when the store opens. So thank you so much, Crystal. You did a fantastic job. I hope that you keep in touch. And Crystal also wrote a blog post, so I'll post that in the notes as well. So thank you again. And any other final parting words of wisdom or advice for anyone else that you would like to share? 
I would definitely say for advice, if you're a student, don't be intimidated. Like I know it seems like a lot, but jump in and I promise you will not regret it. Especially if you're looking for a capstone, try to find anything with advocacy and policy and legislation. It's a huge help. And then for practitioners, like it's, it's never too late to learn about these things. There are a lot of people who don't know anything about it. And there are a lot of great resources, like Clarice's, all of her posts, her website, like, even if you just read those to start yourself off, go for it, it'll get you a lot more comfortable. And I don't know, it just it makes sense to me to do it. And it's really, really helpful. So I think it's something that all OTs will benefit from for sure. Well, and you know, I agree. (laughs) so much for having me over the past 14 weeks, Clarice. Like I said, it's been an invaluable experience for me, truly. Thank you so much. And I have definitely appreciated your help. I honestly don't think I would have gotten this course done if I hadn't had you there to help me. And so you are equally responsible for getting the show on the road. (laughs) Well, alrighty, folks, thank you so much for listening. And thank you, Crystal, for being a fantastic guest on the Amplify OT podcast. Next up, I'm planning an episode on the false claim submission. So kind of a follow up to some of the videos I made on Instagram about skilled nursing facilities that got in trouble for accusations of violating the False Claims Act. So that's our next episode. And of course, if you have any requests, don't hesitate to send me a voice memo or send me an email. And I just love answering people's questions, especially in a podcast. All right, everybody have a fantastic rest of your day. Thank you so much for listening to the Amplify OT podcast. Hey, did you know that I have a free newsletter? Yes, that is correct. In addition to the free podcast, free articles, I also have a free newsletter and you can subscribe using the link in the show notes. This way you will never miss an update. If you love this podcast, I have two requests. First, please consider leaving us a five-star review. And second, consider leaving a gift using the link in the show notes so that I can continue to support this podcast and provide this resource for free. Consider it a gift to your future self. And if you don't love the podcast, well, I hope you just have a fantastic day and forget I said anything about that review. Okay, folks, keep speaking out and speaking often, and I'll catch you next time.